Uh, okay, let's start. So, uh, firstly, I want to just sort of throw out some project ideas, and because I think uh, I would expect that this week you should start that dialogue with me. Um, the projects were kind of nominally due this week, but let's kind of push that deadline to next week. So, uh, I would suggest that come and meet me during my office hours or other times. But I just want to throw out some topics, and also recall you can do projects or you can do kind of a very detailed um, uh, survey paper, okay? So um, one sort of idea that I want to talk was we looked at thus far several examples of how to model um, various components of computing systems. One thing that we didn't talk about much was how to model uh, the sensors themselves. And I think an interesting project would be to uh, take a smartphone device and come up with models of sensors. And I guess the main thing out here is the following, uh, that the way applications use sensors um, can differ. So for example, uh, there is a component about rate, which is how, uh, like in Android, you can specify three, four different rates um, for every sensor, uh, different, like slow to fast. And the other is that we often kind of do access sensors in a bursty fashion, so kind of uh, say idle uh, and then uh, start using it, then go idle. <coughs> and the third aspect is that there might be multiple uh, applications which may be using sensors, so not all the energy consumed uh, in sensing is necessarily um, accounted for by a single application, so some of it would be uh, per application and some of it would be a shared energy, energy usage. So uh, developing this notion uh, out there and you could, uh, I mean the same issue of sharing and all appears in other contexts also. Obviously radios is the same story that there is some baseline cost of keeping the radio up which is, uh, should be charged against uh, multiple different applications but some of it is per, uh, per usage. So the specific thing out here is for sensors but you look at phones uh, you have inertial sensors like accelerometers, gyros, you have magnetic sensor, you have barometer. Um, so some of these kind of sensors are there. Additionally, you have GPS, uh, camera, and microphones. Uh, microphones are increasingly being used for sensors. So all of these are uh, examples. And kind of sense out here would be perhaps in a two, team of two or three, you kind of develop a generic way of describing uh, energy consumption of these sensors in terms of these parameters, the rate, the burstiness of access, and uh, how, uh, whether multiple applications are using it. Um, some of it will also relate to how the OS manages these sensors. So it could be, for example, if no one is using it, then it will, uh, no application is currently using it, it will power it down and then kind of bring it back up. So some of these details would Uh, second one I wanted to bring out was, uh, so uh, we haven't sort of gone to, uh, ha haven't begun to talk about uh, uh, energy usage in buildings and all much, I mean our focus currently is computing systems, um, but uh, in buildings and to some extent in computing systems also, uh, a concern which has been is that if you were to look at how much power is being consumed, kind of a time series of power consumption of a home or a computing device, then you can infer what is happening inside that black box. So in case of a building, it would be that you can make, uh, in, uh, let's limit ourselves to, let's say, homes, so smaller buildings. Uh, you can uh, learn about what appliances are coming on off, these kind of things. In, on the computing side, there is a similar uh, aspect that by looking at the power trace, you can learn something about the behavior of the program, perhaps what pro um, some, some secret, like key of a cryptographic algorithm or perhaps even instructions and all can be learned. In case of buildings, this is called non-intrusive load monitoring and in case of computation, it is often referred to as differential power analysis. Uh, so people have also talked about different ways of combating this. So this particular project that I'm suggesting, and it's actually a bunch of different projects rolled into a single description. <coughs> so uh, there are roughly three kind of techniques people have proposed. One is that using batteries as an energy buffer, so kind of the idea is that uh, at uh, your load, instead of always drawing electricity from uh, the grid, um, you can 
hide its behavior, the time series pattern, by charging the battery at some time and then having the load operate of the battery. So the actual profile that some uh, the utility company would see is different from what you are actually consuming. So you can, for example, uh, hide the fact that you have certain type of appliances and all. So energy buffers is one. Synthetic load is another idea. So kind of I, uh, so this this is kind of akin to what we do um, to make 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 it appear as if someone is living at home. Uh, but uh, kind of uh, going deeper, you could also imagine that if there are some unique appliance signatures, you can try to kind of obfuscate it a bit by having some other uh, fake appliances, a fake load kind of kicking in and um, injecting its own signature uh, out there. And then finally, uh, you could speak to do something uh, like this computationally. So this addition of noise is actually addition of noise to the uh, to the time series data. So kind of the idea is that your smart meter sends out the power trace, which is what the utility is kind of using. And uh, now you could imagine that computationally you kind of add some noise to it in a fashion that utility can still bill you correctly and do whatever it else it wants to, but uh, at the same time uh, you are able to hide. Now all of these have obviously issues and costs and all. Now in some senses, uh, energy buffering and synthetic load uh, are, uh, are th these are physical techniques in some senses controlled by software or materials which is purely a software based issue. Energy buffering would have cost of battery, in particular the battery would age, it would have a capital upfront cost, depreciation over time and all. Synthetic loads would have its own cost. Now uh, in addition of noise uh, has its own limitations. So for example, let's say uh, you were to just add Gaussian noise to the power consumption. Well, if you have very repetitive patterns, then over time that noise can be cancelled out and your privacy can still be kind of leaked or you know, the uh, utility can still learn what's happening. So there are several possible project ideas out there. One is really conduct a deep analysis of these, taking into account the cost and various kind of factors. The other is other uh, kind of project maybe to actually uh, replicate some of this in hardware and uh, try to come up with actual strategies by which, uh, or maybe in simulation, actual strategies that may be used for doing this energy buffering, like given traces. So there are plenty of sort of research groups who have published um, traces of home level power consumption. So the idea would be that you take those traces and then kind of subject them to different kind of techniques, perhaps in map lab simulation or something like that, and show how effective they would be. There is some literature out, out there uh, which kind of explores these techniques, but uh, the idea would be to kind of uh, come up with a more systematic way of doing this. Uh, third idea, third project idea is, and again this is simulation oriented, uh, is the following, that uh, for electric vehicles, so B to B refers to so this is this notion that uh, electric vehicles uh, can also be used as energy buffers for the whole grid at large. So the idea being that let's say you have an electric vehicle, you're parked in the parking lot, um, it's going to, uh, it's, the charging time may be actually much shorter than the vehicle would be parked, but perhaps with some type of incentives and all, you would be willing to let the battery in your car be used as temporary storage for the utility company. So for example, uh, it will charge your vehicle, uh, but then if it needs some extra supply nearby, then it might extract it and then recharge it again. Uh, of course, what you are paying for is the fact that your battery is aging more rapidly. So therefore, that cost has to be accounted for. So this concept has been thrown around for a bit and all, but um, uh, and kind of, uh, some analysis and all out there. Practically, it doesn't happen much because most electric vehicles currently do not allow uh, the reverse flow of energy. But uh, the idea here would be to do this simulation analysis, and particularly taking into account battery aging, that is uh, the cost structure out there. Because the idea would be that uh, to incentivize people, uh, somehow you have to make sure that uh, they are appropriately compensated for. So it could be cheaper price or these kind of things. So conduct an analysis. Uh, detecting malware from power trace. 
So this is kind of the same grain out here. So this, these power traces have a lot of No, my laptop has issues. Uh, on uh, so, um, uh, power trace, as you can realize, has lots of information that we have talked about out here. Um, uh, one of the things you could also do potentially is to detect malware. So, kind of the idea is that uh, detecting unusual things happening in a computing system, and oftentimes unusual thing is out of the ordinary activity. So, like some malware is on the device and all. Could you detect that from the power trace? Okay, so the reason this kind of is potentially interesting is the following: that any measure that you take within the operating system, like uh, some antivirus, anti-malware software, and all, they can themselves be compromised, right? So you cannot really trust a software-based mechanism because a malware could compromise it and essentially go undetected. Whereas a power trace-based mechanism sitting outside uh, is a little bit like analyzing network traffic. So some of the uh, malware detection techniques rely on looking at the uh, snoop, uh, looking at the traffic on the network, and then they say, "Aha, this machine has been compromised." You can similarly imagine that by looking at the power trace of a computer, could you detect uh, things have been compromised? Perhaps different malware have unique signatures. Uh, 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 this one is more. Uh, 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 perhaps more appropriate for a survey sample. So there are several, I mean, there are at least so three significant mobile OSs out there, and they take somewhat different philosophy towards uh, how to do the power management. Okay, so what level of, um, you know, what is the split between uh, the OS doing stuff, which is kind of more of an iOS kind of thing, versus leaving the burden on the application. So like in case of Android, there is this notion of uh, wake locks. So kind of the way power management in Android works is that if you need a resource and you don't want the OS to shut it down, then you are going to explicitly kind of take a lock on it, and that's called wake lock. Uh, and uh, so you can lock different parts of the system. Um, uh, the problem that, uh, of course, the flip side that happens is that now uh, sometimes applications forget to release the lock and that ends up burning energy and all, whereas in case of iOS, it's more of a uh, OS sort of orchestrates these things. So kind of the idea out here would be to compare uh, these different strategies and of course the third one is Windows Mobile and there are some other mobile OSs which have begun to emerge, there is Samsung Tizen and uh, the others. So kind of steady the power management. There are a couple of diff different ways or perhaps a combination here that you do some simple experiments to see how uh, effective they are. But so some of these things may have to do with it under similar workloads, one strategy is better than the other. Some of the differences are more like I said, like wake lock bugs, which uh, Android, which have been an issue on the Android side, uh, not on the iOS side because there's no notion of locking there. So comparing these things. Uh, another idea, a uh, project idea, Idea, uh, would be approximate computing. So approximate computing refers to the fact that perhaps we can save energy by relaxing on the accuracy requirement. Okay, so what I mean by that is, let's say you have to do some computation and there is some measure of the quality of the output. So it could be how many search results you get, maybe how accurately you computed the numerical answers, um, if it's a machine learning classifier, maybe what percentage accuracy you're going to get in your review and those kind of things. So approximate computing refers to the fact that could we do this kind of a trade-off that what if I offered you the deal that, you know, uh, you'll get to run on factor of two less power, but you will be slightly inaccurate, okay, maybe 5% inaccurate. Uh, so approximate computing is, uh, uh, sort of takes that view and for a variety of different things, people are exploring these things. And in many applications, you can imagine that uh, this is perfectly fine. Like, for example, let's say you do search on Google, and if it, instead of returning 500 million results, it returns 100 million results, and so for all practical purposes, it's still the same. Uh, whereas in other applications, that may be an issue. Um, um, sensor type stuff 
is particularly suited for this because it's a, has a very graceful kind of thing. So images, voice quality, all these kind of things. So uh, looking, uh, I've kind of uh, not gone into detail out there, but if this topic interests you, you can kind of talk and define uh, something. So this is kind of an initial list. I'm going to keep adding to it over the next few days. Um, if you have ideas, come and talk to me um, perfectly sort of I mean, again, since no one thus far came to talk to me about any idea of their own, so I decided to kind of seek something, okay? <clears throat> but I really kind of ur urge you to kind of do that. Again, it could be power in any context, really. Okay, you could, some other ideas, like for example, uh, perhaps um, what, what's happening in many cases nowadays is that we are shifting uh, things that were done physically to things which are now done, done virtually, like take things like watching movies and sort of de delivery over the DVD, it's delivered over networks, so kind of analyzing uh, some of these things from an energy perspective, then as they move, as they become less and all kind of um, uh, other, uh, other things could be as new technologies are introduced, they come with their own uh, sort of different power characteristics, okay, so we saw the example of that how uh, OLED uh, displays have kind of a different characteristics, perhaps. Uh, they are, uh, some other uh, similar subsystem where it has different characteristics, new kind of radios keep emerging. So, for example, if you look at Wi Fi, we are kind of undergoing a transition towards uh, A2.11ac, so which is kind of the latest standard. Perhaps characterizing that might be a pretty decent project and comparing it against. Uh, dot end type stuff, which is kind of the previous generation of uh, Wi-Fi. <coughs> so uh, that that would be uh, an example uh, of like looking at new type, uh, new technology which has been introduced and seeing kind of what is the significance of that. So anyway, uh, these are some ideas. Uh, question? Anyone? No? Okay, so a kind of general expectation is you should have a project kind of figured out by next week. So let me start talking with you. Uh, and uh, if the office hour time doesn't work for you, then write to me. You can call me. Okay. Uh, how, how, yeah, go ahead. Project team size, any size. I mean, if all the entire class wants to get together and do something ambitious, I'm all for it, okay? Uh, it's, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, so again, I mean, commensurate with what you're proposing, okay? So there's no kind of hard thing. And again, I mean, a big difference this time around is I'm explicitly permitting uh, sort of uh, uh, more of survey kind of stuff also. But again, the expectation there is a very serious survey, okay? I mean, yeah, that's 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 something to bear in mind. I would say generally speaking, uh, well, so another thing I would, what kind of things I can provide to you, okay, so that's also very important. So uh, in my lab, we have various infrastructure to let you measure power consumption of various kind of devices, okay, so we have implementation, uh, things, for, for example, for mobile phones and all, we have systems where we can essentially intercept between the battery and the phone, of course, not for all phones, not all phones expose the battery, but many do. Uh, so we have that. I also have some stuff, some some certain platforms where the board itself has va various power, uh, various subcomponent level power measurement capabilities. Uh, these are more embedded in flavor. Uh, we also have, if you kind of go higher up, uh, we also have power measurement at the levels of homes and uh, buildings. These are already out there in the sense that. Uh, uh, my lab is instrumented in the circuit breaker level. I have a lot of, I have these kind of implementations deployed at my home. There are also power traces available, uh, like for example, the group, the group at University of Massachusetts, Amherst, they publish a lot, CMU. So these are all sort of publicly available data sets, uh, which basically give you, in some cases, whole home, so for a whole bunch of home. In some cases, they are uh, at plug level granularity, so like few appliances, but they will also tell you how much the appliances were contributing, were, were consuming. Uh, a lot of the research in that area is focused on, in the home level, has focused on a couple of things. One is that by looking at the aggregate power trace, can I infer what is happening inside, okay? So can I infer what different appliances were consuming? Um, 
currently there is a company called o power um, it's a publicly traded company and what they do is they work with certain electric utilities and when you re receive your electric bill they also tell you how much your fridge consumed how much your whatever tv consumed and all to some extent and how accurately and all is subject to debate but they kind of break it down without obviously putting anything inside your phone they're only analyzing the smart meter time series data so those techniques are called nylon non-intrusive load monitoring there are some close cousins of it one is something called non-intrusive load verification and what that refers to is the fact that in some cases electric utilities uh, give you lower uh, rates in exchange that you will comply with orders to shut down certain appliances except that people cheat so the idea is that uh, they want to make sure that you are not uh, running an appliance okay so uh, that's that's the notion of load verification that you did comply with that you turned off the ac or the ac is at a lower temperature uh, and the third usage is occupancy so non-intrusive occupancy inferences so the idea is by looking at these can i infer how much how many people are there okay uh, so then, then we can do a lot of stuff around it uh, on the action side it can range from like what Opower is doing that just giving you breakdowns so that perhaps you can say you know maybe i can save energy here to it could use could be used for more real-time state control extract control cycle control these kind of things um, there are similar issues one can imagine for other type of meters uh, water and gas similar kind of things later in the course we'll sort of go into it but if that space interests you uh, i can point you to kind of material and my next slides and all um, you could do the same kind of stuff as we see for computers also so early work in this space for example back in 90s people showed that by looking at the power trace uh, of a processor um, you could figure out the cryptographic key which was being used so the idea is depending upon the zero one pattern in the key uh, whenever it was a zero so, so this was for a particular cryptographic protocol the power consumption will go up and it was a one it will go down or vice versa and then by looking at that pattern you, they could basically decode uh, the key or at least decode enough bits so that it after that brute force search can work more recent work, um, including some in my group, has shown that we can, e for certain kind of processors, we can even figure out what instruction was being executed, okay, or and, and, and with what data value. So essentially, with the power trace, you can kind of begin to infer the state of computation. Okay. So anyway, I'll keep adding to this. I'll send a link out for this particular file which is on Google Doc and kind of keep adding to it but um, hopefully if you get the conversation started come and talk to me um, again I'm open to the full spectrum of projects you want to build something my lab again measurement type capabilities we have a variety of boards which already have uh, uh, subsystem level thing um, we also have specific mobile devices from Qualcomm uh, which do not have the cellular radio but otherwise they are like an Android, the Android devices, and we have subsystem level power consumption in there uh, at, at I think around 100 hertz sampling rate. Um, we have, um, as I said, it's a building scale stuff. I can also get you power uh, consumption data and all for electric vehicles, which is uh, sort of the very first group out there. Um, so, anyway, so fair bit of sort of both data and kind of the different types of stuff and measurement. Uh, if you want to fish for more ideas, uh, in the very first lecture I had some pointers to some conferences and all, but um, perhaps uh, there's a, a workshop called Hot Power, uh, which tends to have some interesting early stage type work up here. If you Google for Hot Power, you'll find that. There is an international symposium on low power electronics and design. That tends to be more mature pieces of work. And then if you go after, uh, since a lot of power stuff has to do with mobile systems, so if you look at conferences like Mobisys, Mobicom, uh, they tend to have papers, uh, always have some papers on power and energy for mobile phones. Uh, for building, it's BuildSys, and for sensors, it's Sensys. Everything is something Sys. So Sensys, BuildSys, Mobisys, 
um, uh, these are good starting point, and then Mobicom, Ubicom, which again is used for self central science ideas also, but which should be a start. Uh, steam up, um, uh, so that we are not kind of working on it alone, unless you have, I hope you want to do something tied to your research. Yeah. Okay, questions, any more questions besides the team phase? Okay, so, uh, uh, one other thing, uh, I'll be, uh, I am also going to be sending out uh, paper presentation thing, so the way it would work is I will, instead of sort of going through a, polling, you know, like who wants to sign up on what paper, I'm just going to assign them, okay, so uh, just keep my life simple, okay, so now we are down to 16 students, and so 16 papers is what we are kind of looking for, and we'll start on it, you know, that's what the registrar office says, I know you're counting, okay, but there are not 16 here in the class, so 3, uh, 9, and 5, 14, so, okay, so maybe it's 14, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just assign and uh, if when you get the assignment email acknowledge so that I know you are okay okay uh, and I'm sure I'll lose some more of you after I think okay so uh, okay so last time around we were look, uh, going deeper into the battery model and uh, we had looked into kind of one of the effects uh, so I mentioned two effects one is how uh, the capacity of the battery that we get to utilize depends upon the rate at which we draw the energy, essentially the current. Um, and then I also kind of talked about the other effect, which we haven't gone into, which we didn't go into depth into, which is uh, this um, sort of uh, use the battery, stop using it for a while, use the battery again, stop using it for a while, and kind of watch this process. That uh, dependence upon the rate, uh, the rate capacity effect, also led to this thing that if I were to make some change to my system, which changed its power consumption and changed its performance, the speed, then there is a non-linearity that emerges because of the Fugert law, which was a simplified model of rate capacity effect, so that uh, as I ran the system slower, uh, then uh, I may be able to run it for longer, as in uh, do more work. But then at some stage, other non-idealities begin to kick in and that effect will be counteracted. So upshot is that there is some optimum speed or optimum speed performance setting at which I should, uh, I should run the system. So uh, there are, uh, so this optimum speed now, if we kind of look back at the discussion, there are two different reasons why this optimum speed arises. One reason it arises is if we go back to that uh, our leakage versus dynamic power consumption. So that alone gives us a sense of that there would be some optimum speed because if I ran very slowly and my leakage power was high enough, then that would begin to dominate. Uh, if on the other hand, uh, if I ran very fast and leakage power was low, then I'm actually wasting, uh, op operating suboptimally for the dynamic power consumption, the CV squared type. So, give it any real system, that alone, independent of battery and all, would lead to some optimum speed of operation. Then furthermore, batteries lead to an additional thing, which is, if I were to operate with a high current, then I am reducing the capacity, uh, as in the number of joules I can extract, and uh, that leads to some further things. So, the reality would then involve both these factors and kind of your eventual uh, sweet spot for speed would have to take into account both these factors. Okay, so the next effect, which sort of we refer to is this uh, relaxation effect, namely, should I draw the energy out of the battery at a constant rate or should I pulse it? So, kind of the observation out here is that for certain uh, kinds of battery chemistry, there's a very pronounced effect that as I drain. Um, as I as I as I drain the power, um, just a sec, please. So as I drain, uh, 
as I yeah. as I drain the power, if I were to let it rest, then uh, internally the chemicals in the battery get a chance to sort of relax a few bit, and so battery appears to battery recovers the active material. So kind of intuitively, what happens inside is that uh, you really uh, the voltage that you see in the electrodes really depends upon how much of the active material is near the electrodes. But those ions which carry the charge, they have uh, inertia. So uh, as I draw them out, it's not as if the concentration is even throughout the battery. So what happens is it depletes near the electrodes because that's where we are drawing the charge away. But then uh, so our voltage drops and it seems, and then at some stage voltage goes below the cutoff that we are interested in and we declare the battery to be dead. Then if you leave it, if you let the battery rest, then that active material kind of uh, diffuses and the concentration elsewhere goes down, but near the electrode it recovers. And now your battery again appears alive. Okay, so the longer the rest period, the better is the recovery. And that's, that's kind of the intuitive idea. So what one can question? So on the, um, what kind of battery is it? Yeah, so it is less pronounced. Uh, it's actually uh, relatively unpronounced in the tip. Okay, but it's very pronounced in like nitride and nickel. Okay, so it is battery chemistry. Okay. Um, <coughs> so pulse discharge is this notion that we deliberately operate the battery this way. Okay, I mean of course many a times our workload naturally exhibits this kind of pulsing, but what if we were naturally uh, we were to deliberately do this thing? So essentially, intuitively, if you may say this argues again for run fast to completion strategy as opposed to run slowly and fog all the time. Um, uh, so uh, ideally what you would like to do is by using this strategy, what we should do is we should, we can perhaps make sure that when the back, when we declare the battery dead, then it is truly dead. It's not as if it actually has left over capacity or the way which we are unable to use. Uh, this also leads to kind of a issue which is how do you define uh, battery life, okay, that is, when do you declare a battery to be dead, okay, uh, so uh, a very common definition used is time to first, uh, the first time when the battery dies as in its voltage falls below a certain threshold, okay, but you could also imagine that I may have some other different uh, definitions associated with it, and, and once you go to a network setting, it becomes even more tricky that is it is my network dead if one of the sensors have died or is it dead when a certain fraction has died all those kind of questions could come in. So uh, pulse discharge is kind of a strategy that one could uh, use. So uh, we could uh, imagine protocols where radios are deliberately kind of duty cycle we kind of send in a certain burst likewise we could imagine operating systems where CPU is deliberately idle uh, with, or with a shutdown, essentially to kind of deliberately create these opportunities for batteries to relax. So to summarize, uh, uh, there are two effects that uh, matter, rate capacity and relaxation. And uh, this kind of leads to that if you have a very complicated battery system, uh, what strategy dominates which so if I have n batteries, is it better for me to use them in parallel with a lower current, or is it better for me to use one at a time with a higher current? Um, uh, so this this kind of effect in the uh, uh, from a system designer perspective, you can uh, imagine that uh, you can sort of worry about these things. So in any case, uh, these two effects sort of come into play. So if you look at uh, 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 lithium ion type batteries and all, you would see. Like if you look at data sheets and all, you would see these kind of effects sort of uh, given. So for example, in the top one, what you are seeing is the discharge capacity and um, so how much energy are able to get out of the battery and there are three curves out there. The red one is for 180 milliamps, the uh, green one is for 100 milliamps, and the blue one is 50 milliamps. So what this is showing is the uh, rate capacity effect that is I'm only able to get around maybe 770 milliamp power if I draw at a higher current. On the other hand, uh, with uh, uh, 180 milliamp draw, I can go to 1950 milliamp power. So, 
uh, it would have some interesting kind of uh, effects. Uh, so uh, the first one is rate dependent capacity. The other thing is temperature matching. Okay, so as the battery temperature changes, those entire curves kind of shift, and this again kind of ends up uh, uh, playing a role because you can imagine as your system is heating up, uh, maybe it might be a good strategy to let it cool down before uh, it shifts. So what you see out here is again battery operating at different temperatures. So cold battery uh, like below sub zero zero. Uh, the green one is twenty forty five. And as intuitively, I mean, we relate in our life that our cars have a harder time starting in cold weather and all. So cold on the battery. The third one is capacity fading. And what capacity fading refers to is that as we use the, uh, this is for rechargeable batteries. So as we use the battery, then the fully recharged battery holds less and less and less of charge. Okay, so essentially, its capacity is fading over time. And that is in terms of number of cycles. So what you see out here is that as this battery is being used, then uh, it started out sort of up here, and it, there's a gradual, gradual kind of uh, falling of the capacity as it happens. And usually, what happens out here is that we define a battery to be uh, no longer useful when its capacity has faded to 80% of the rated capacity. So when it starts out, it has some value. One and then when it has gone down to 0.8, then we declare it to be kind of that's how we define the cycle life of the battery. And current batteries are probably uh, a good rule of thumb might be something like order of a thousand, maybe 500 uh, cycles before they kind of reach that state. Uh, what also matters is how deep these charge recharges. So, for example, uh, if I fully discharge and charge. The number of cycles I get would be different if, for example, I discharge 10% and recharge again. So, um, so anyway, that's that's an effect. Uh, one a paper I was reading was it was kind of also pointing out that there is this interesting effect. So, our phones. This is this was specifically for mobile devices. Is oftentimes sort of intuitively you would think that if I have plugged in the phone then I am actually not using the battery, it's good for the battery and all. Unfortunately, what happens is that the chargers on the phone are uh, unable to supply usually the peak current that your phone demands. So your phone is plugged in, maybe it's doing something computationally intensive like maybe updating the apps or whatever, the radio and on and things like that. Um, the thing is your battery may actually be charging, discharging even though you are plugged in, okay, because, and the reason being that the adapters do not have enough uh, current uh, horsepower to supply it. Um, uh, this sort of curiosity. So, anyone knows how much current can USB charger supply? The ones which we use on our phones. Hmm? So, USB standard has sort of uh, essentially. Uh, two tiers, okay? One is kind of a good, or, well, three tiers really, okay? So originally USB uh, specified three, two, two current levels. One was 100 milliamp and the other was 500 milliamp, okay? So uh, 500 milliamp is what you would have found in your laptops and all, okay? But then as um, mobile devices became more hungry and uh, more importantly as we began to use USB as uh, for as charging things so like those USB adapters which kind of became popular so they had so these are ports in kind of those adapters so then I guess Apple was the first one to jump ship uh, and, and introduce the non-standard uh, charging current level of uh, 15 uh, 1.5 amp okay so essentially you have 100 milliamp, 500 milliamp, and then 1500 milliamp. But then, of course, you also needed a way to detect what was happening. So uh, that is, what kind of charger are you plugged in? So uh, this is where sometimes when you buy a USB charger, you would see that it is for Apple devices versus Android devices or Apple versus non-Apple and all. And the reason is because these different devices used a different strategy to figure out 
what current level was the adapter capable of supplying okay so uh, in particular um, in some cases they look at what is the resistance so usb has power ground and data plus data minus so the way the nature of the adapter is encoded is the resistance between d plus and ground d minus and ground and whether the d plus d minus are shorted so for example if d plus and d minus are shorted that means that you have a wall adapter which is capable of 1500 milliamp if on the other hand it's a port on your laptop and the resistance between d plus and ground and d minus and ground x is of certain value then it indicates that that laptop port is capable of supplying a 1500 milliamp and then finally uh, there is also a negotiation capability that is it actually sends some bits back and forth over D plus D minus to say I'm capable of doing it. So essentially the device starts out with a low current level, negotiates, figures out that it's actually capable of a higher current level and kind of sits with that. So, so uh, anyway, the upshot is that your phone may be plugged into a USB port which is capable of supplying only 500 milliamps, in which case your battery will actually have to compensate for that lower current level coming and therefore even though you are plugged in your battery may actually be subjected to uh, uh, maybe getting subjected to this uh, second effect. Additional issues with rechargeable batteries. So there is self charge. Uh, is that why some phones uh, they have to be on when it's charging like you can't charge the phone with off state? Is this related or is that uh, reason that you can't? There shouldn't be any reason for a phone to not to be able to recharge, I mean, this would be a problem with the phone. So it's not, nothing with the USB standard per se. Um, yeah, so uh, the other thing interestingly is that, uh, I don't know if you have noticed this effect that your phone is not charging, you unplug it, plug it back in, and now suddenly it begins to charge. So what happens out there is that the USB, uh, because of these multiple levels of charging, they also have uh, a feature built in now that USB port resets uh, or goes into a power down mode if uh, excess current is drawn. And the only way to reset it is to actually unplug and plug back again. Okay, so that's, that's how we can do that. So, yeah. Does it allow a mechanism for when the battery is full to stop charging so that it's overcharging? Yes, and that's very important. Okay, so just to give an example, uh, I, most of our devices use with Pixels, our phone and stuff like that, okay? Um, so there are uh, there are a few different things. So number one, if you if you charge at a wrong voltage, slightly wrong voltage, okay, uh, most lithium cells, if you charge at more than 4.2 volts, they will explode. Okay, <laughs> so there's a lot of protection built in for that. Well, well the threshold is a bit it's a few hundred milli uh, few hundred millivolt above 4.2. So let's say sake of argument, maybe 4.6, 4.7. But as you go above 4.2, like from going from 4.2 to 4.25, apparently there is a 30% more rapid aging of your battery. Okay, so essentially, uh, there, so two effects, right? One is uh, if the voltage is too high, there is a thermal runaway happens and battery literally explodes, okay? And the other one is that if it is as it gets higher, there is a rapid aging which is happening, okay, and that is also detrimental. So, uh, now, in, so, so the thing is to protect against all of these things, there are circuits built in, and also when it reaches a level, it shuts down. So, what if in some time you cannot charge and the battery? Uh, in, in case of lithium ion, it does not charge. Okay, so this refers to another effect which I do not have out here is a so-called memory effect, okay? So uh, does it affect whether I charge it before it was fully discharged? Does it affect whether I stop charging before it was fully charged? All of these things are chemistry dependent. In some chemistries, we do have this effect, yeah. But lithium ion, interesting. Anyway, uh, going back out here, uh, so additional issues with rechargeable batteries are self-discharge. So even if you do not use the battery, it is leaking current away, okay? Um, the cycle life I already talked about, and aging refers to basically batteries age. That is, even if I am not cycling them at all, if they're just sitting on the 
showed this is so you buy a rechargeable battery, you never use it, it's not, and then come back a year later or five years later, it's not going to be sitting there, it's not factory fresh anymore, okay, so it's, even though you haven't used it, um, essentially the chemicals in there go through some changes and all and that you lose that. So, um, these effects kind of matter. Uh, when it comes to cycle, uh, <coughs> cycle life, so as I mentioned, we look for a 20% that is how the cycle life is defined, okay? Um, so depth of discharge matter. So this is for some, yeah, you can look in metal hydride battery, okay, okay. So if in this particular battery, if we were to do all charges, discharges at 100% depth, that is let the battery discharge and only then charge it back up, uh, then you would get around, I don't know, 300 something or cycle. But if you were to do discharges, percent shallow or deep, then this let the battery go to half the point and come back up. Uh, it, you know, this also happens in the air then or that kind of, okay. So much depends upon the type of usage you are suspecting to and also what kind of individual you are. So there are a few studies which have been done where they analyze the charge discharge charging behaviors of individuals. Okay. By the way, this is another data set we have access to from a group in UK, where for a few thousand users, they have every power-related event from their phones. Okay, so it's a gold mine of interesting insights waiting to be drawn. Um, uh, going coming back out here, so if how many of you wait until the phone shows you the red uh, back? Okay, and how many of you opportunistically charge the phone? I mean, I fall into that category. Whenever I'm in the car, I plug it in, stuff like that. I guess I never don't want to be get, get caught, right? And just by habit, I'm in the car, it's plugged in. Uh, so this kind of a bimodal behavior exists among individuals. I guess it says something about our personalities. Uh, but it ends up affecting what is happening uh, to the device and how much, how the battery would age and stuff like that, okay? Uh, so uh, battery aging uh, point I've already made that uh, uh, there is and there are several effects that play out here so as we use the battery they age as we don't use the battery they are aging and then finally if they are charged they are still leaking the charge okay so you cannot let the charge sit there all these effects can come out of course batteries have been improving there are new battery chemistries last time there was mention of the element uh, aluminum ion batteries and also the new, new chemistries will keep coming but it, but at a much slower pace because developing a new battery chemistry is a pretty complicated thing and requires changing a whole ecosystem around it also new type of chargers battery monitors stuff like that so uh, when it comes to managing the battery one of the things that obviously becomes important is uh, something called state of charge which is how much charge the battery has, because uh, how, how can you kind of reliably know that, okay? The problem is that you cannot determine the state of charge directly, because state of charge refers to how much active material is in the battery, and short of having some sensor inside the battery, monitoring the level of those chemicals, you really can't know. In some batteries we do, right? I mean, um, in the car batteries and all, before the singed car batteries came into being, when your battery would die, they would come and dip something into the fluid in the battery and say, aha, this is the uh, level of, uh, uh, this is the state of the chemicals and say something about the battery. Okay. But those days are gone, batteries are sealed, and certainly with things like lithium ion and all, you cannot do it. So, uh, so, uh, so we really uh, need uh, sort of some other access. So this, this was the, so a very common one is voltage based okay so what you do is you look at the uh, uh, voltage of the battery now the voltage of the battery is the one which matters is what is called as open circuit voltage when no current is flowing through the battery so you look at that voltage and then you somehow translate that into the state of charge that is a map into what percentage of the battery charge is remaining so at 100% charge, it would have something, and then as it is dying, it will have some other value. So, so that's that's kind of the idea. It converts a reading of the battery voltage to the state of charge using some known discharge curve, as in you calibrate. So, uh, I recall just from my uh, Apple 
laptop, uh, until a few years ago, they actually had a calibration process. That is, they would make you go through a process where you would fully charge your laptop, then disconnect it from the power, and then let it fully discharge, and then charge it back up and use. So what they would be doing is essentially developing this calibration curve. I think what has happened now, so I don't see that process anymore. Apple doesn't state it explicitly. So I suspect what has happened now is that they have either found a way of doing in situ calibration or perhaps their batteries are so well calibrated right at right up front that they don't need to do a in field calibration. But basic idea is that you develop a voltage versus percentage charge curve. So when your phone shows percentage battery level and all, uh, it's basically really reading the voltage and then translating it into that. But the problem is voltage is significantly affected by the battery current and the temperature. Uh, so this, that's what we see in relaxation as we kind of draw out the charge. We kind of so, uh, so uh, the idea then becomes that we try to make it a little bit more, uh, we try to compensate for it by somehow introducing a battery current term or uh, looking up the open circuit voltage. The problem with open circuit voltage is you have to stop the system uh, to get the open circuit voltage. So obviously it's not possible for us to do it other than if the battery is sitting outside. So in a running system, the only voltage you really have access to is when the system is running because you are kind of measuring it. Uh, perhaps you could design things so that the rest of the system is off and then uh, for a short period of time and then you kind of measure the voltage of the battery. A very low power introduced um, So uh, voltage uh, measurement based approach is one. Then uh, another one is a process which uses uh, essentially food on uh, counting, counting the charge. So kind of the idea now is that uh, throughout you monitor the current being drawn from the battery and the voltage. And then you integrate this, so you have a time series of voltage and current. So you integrate these things, and essentially you are seeing how much power was being uh, the power curve out of the battery. And then integrated over time, it gives you the amount of charge that you need. So it calculates the charge by monitoring the current and integrating it over time. Uh, the problem out here is uh, you do need sort of calibration to be done out there, uh, but kind of rough, basically the approach is. Uh, battery holds cer certain amount of Coulomb, and I'm going to subtract at any given point in time. Uh, then there are approaches that go more sort of sophisticated. Uh, or, uh, so, for example, start using Kalman filtering. So, Kalman filtering is generic. Uh, some of you I know are familiar with it, but those of you are not, uh, it's basically a way of tracking the state of a system. Okay, so in this case, the state is the state of charge. So we model the battery as kind of a dynamical system and then use a Kalman filter to monitor that state or estimate that state. And I have indirect evidence of that true state of the charge through the measurements I have, like the voltage, for example. Uh, so voltage and pull of voltage both, and then you track the parameters of that battery point. There are, uh, we, we can certainly put other types of sensors inside the battery, so pressure, uh, so, uh, so that's these are some of the ways. Uh, depth of discharge is a related measure, where uh, depth of discharge so it's, it's kind of the complement of state of charge. So sometimes you will see depth of discharge is kind of referred to the same thing. Now, state of charge is a very commonly used terms and all, and you would see uh, even it's used not sorry, not just for mobile devices and all. It's the same terminology used for let's say electric vehicle batteries and stuff like that. What's the state of the charge? And that translates into other measures like how long your system will last doing certain tasks, or in case of cars, how long would it, whatever, what's the remaining range and stuff like that. So state of charge is one measure. Now, the other measure which is associated with batteries is state of health. Now, state of health is refers to the aging-related phenomenon of the battery, right? So we kind of talked about that how batteries age, their capacity fades and all. So this is, so state of charge is basically focused on what is going to happen until the battery discharges. So it's at a current point in time or the current charge discharge cycle. The state of health is an overall metric of saying something about the condition of the battery. And this
this is kind of a uh, rigged up metric in the sense that it's basically saying that, look, if battery is healthy, it's 100%. Okay, so it's akin to saying, okay, I'm fully healthy versus I, wanna, uh, I feel somewhat unhealthy and I'm really unhealthy. So kind of some vague metric is being used out, out here. Its units are basically just percentage. Okay, so it's normalized to one basically. And uh, uh, the idea is that when state of health reaches some threshold, then we basically say, look, this battery cell is no longer good, we can replace it. Uh, so it's not, not a particular quantity, but sort of some made up metric, composite metric, which is taking into account a whole bunch of stuff, like for example, capacity, voltage, sensitive charge, even if you accept a new charge. Sometimes, like when the batteries die, one of the effects you see is that you cannot recharge them anymore. Uh, number of charge, good charge cycles. So, uh, it's some, again, many of the phones and all kind of let you look at the uh, battery health and they kind of show some of these measures and then they say something about the overall health quality of the battery and should the battery be replaced or not. So state of health gets used a couple of ways. I mean, one is for your overall battery pack, whether it's useless now. And the other one is that a given cell in a battery pack. So battery pack may have many cells, and it could be that one cell is aged more than the other cell. So what happens is the following uh, oftentimes. So let's imagine I have a battery which has some, let's say, three cells in series. The reason I may have three cells in series is to get to the right voltages. Now, what happens is these cells are not identical. So when I charge them up, remember I said that we do not want the voltage to exceed a certain level on the cell because then the battery can explode or degrade very rapidly. So what happens is we stop charging when one of the cells, uh, any one of the cells first reaches that critical threshold. But since these cells are not identical, what happens is that the other cells have not reached that threshold voltage. So they are, uh, their state of charge is different. They're, they will age differently. And over time, this effect gets magnified. So what may end up happening is in my battery pack, some cells are aging more rapidly or getting more used because they were weaker to begin with, so to say. And then that effect gets magnified. So state of health is then used by these systems to look at these cells and then reconfigure the battery pack. So it could be that a cell was in, teamed up with two other cells and then as it aged, we swap it out, bring a new cell. Now, of course, we don't physically do it. We reconfigure the circuit topology so that uh, the right cells are. So it's, that kind of stuff is not done in phones and all, uh, but it's very commonly done in uh, electric vehicle or uh, battery packs for buildings. So state of health. Uh, so yeah, so this was a cell mass problem that I was referring to that uh, in, a, in a complete battery pack, not all cells are identical. And so some of it is uh, they had manufacturing variations. Some of it is that they were located in different places in the system. So they were subjected to different temperatures. So therefore they aged differently. Uh, and then as we use them, th these differences in the cells get magnified and uh, basically end up with a battery pack which is quite heterogeneous across the cell. So as the cells age, they lose capacity and they diverge even more. Okay, that's kind of the, uh, so you, have, you see this uneven aging and then the weak cells are the ones Start. Same effect, by the way, happens in capacitors also. Capacitors also age as you use them, and again, tiny variations in them can cause them to diverge farther apart. So, again, okay, capacitors also need to be put in uh, series and batteries. So, uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, what ends up happening is that uh, uh, modern battery packs or devices have essentially a fairly complicated sort of algorithm, algorithmic piece surrounding the batteries, which is managing these batteries, okay, with the eye that uh, all these uh, cells are balanced, they age 
together, all those effects come in. So, so the ba uh, basic idea is that uh, 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 we always try to maintain a few conditions that if cells have the same capacity, then they should have the same uh, state of charge, so they should be balanced. Um, and uh, in case of uh, cells of different capacity, we need to run. Some of the times, these are done using just circuit hardware level approaches, but other times it is it is it is done using sort of this active management using the software. So uh, there are chips which are sold which are essentially battery management systems and electric vehicles and all these are much more complicated than let's say something uh, your mobile devices and all. But essentially what ends up happening is that there are times at which you would differentially charge the batteries and all. So like for example uh, I had uneven cells. What may end up happening is that if I do not take care, then as so, so if I only were to look at let's let's charge all the cells fully, then what may end up happening is that the cells which charged up first, so to say, they will start heating up. So there's a wave of energy spreading towards towards potentially exploding if you don't take care of it. So what you basically do at some stage is that at some stage you say, okay, this way is full. Stop charging it, and then divert uh, the current which was going into this cell onto the other cell. So what they do is they put additional circuit pathways so that you can selectively stop a cell from charging. So you can kind of do these kind of complicated things, or you can do uh, more sophisticated stuff where basically there's a little microcontroller sitting and kind of uh, instead of simply a resistive path, you basically uh, uh, control what, how much current charging current is going to different cells using um, basically the software control. I'm not going to go into details, but this is kind of a high level idea. So all of this comes together in these battery management systems. Okay, so these are electronic systems which sit around the rechargeable battery and take care of all these aspects. So they have, they have to protect the cells. They have to make sure that it doesn't age uh, too rapidly. They have to make sure that it gets charged properly. And uh, then they monitor it at runtime. They look at its temperature. They look at the state of charge. Um, they uh, change the usage uh, accordingly. So they monitor things like voltage uh, of individual cells, temperature of the cell, state of charge, state of the charge. Uh, they monitor the state of cells in uh, some cases, like electric vehicles and all. They even have coolings and things like that. So all of this is kind of monitored by these systems. In our mobile phones, they are simpler, but they're still there. So uh, uh, when you buy the battery, or so-called smart batteries, they actually come with these things built in. Okay, so the idea is that, that uh, they do not want to depend upon the intelligence of surrounding systems necessarily. So they design the battery packs to have these capabilities uh, built in. But not always. You can certainly buy sort of uh, the native lithium ion packs and use and then surround them with a appropriate circuit, but one has to be very careful. And just as a side note, I have had two cases of explosion in my lab slash group around lithium ion uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, uh, one case was in my lab where uh, we were charging stuff and it spontaneously catches fire, really. And uh, my student. Uh, one of the, uh, the so pretty, let's say, worldly wise, he kind of immediately took it out. He happened to be right next to the exit of Walter Hall, took it out, exploded there. So that doesn't happen. The other case was unfortunately more uh, nastier one. So after that first episode happened, what we did was we bought um, uh, special packs, uh, bags essentially, which contained the explosion, okay, and we would charge inside them. Okay, so what happened was that the student uh, was working on some sensor nodes which we were deploying out in Marina Del Rey, some underwater stuff. So moisture and lithium are, as you know, pretty, uh, they don't go well together. So anyway, uh, what he was doing was he was, his apartment was nearby, so he would charge in his apartment and then conduct experiments to get what happened, it exploded. In that particular case, the apartment caught fire and nasty stuff happened. Okay, so um, uh, so lithium packs, I mean, I guess uh, don't leave them plugged in. Uh, 
uh, yes, I, I'm sure you have heard of these cases about explosion happening in the and all that and sort of things setting. Uh, the, uh, battery technology has improved quite a bit, but when improperly used, particularly in cheaper electronics and all, once in a while things go wrong. Okay, and of course, we were operating it when you know in a moisture laden environment, so it wasn't. Okay, so BMSs basically uh, consist of sort of all this control hardware and software which monitor uh, all these characteristics of the battery, safety uh, and aging and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm going to skip these things. Um, yeah, I'm going to come, come back to some of these later, okay. Uh, what I want to go next towards is that uh, battery models. Uh, so we saw uh, we saw some uh, thus far. So we saw the Pukert's formula, but as you can see, the Pukert's formula was uh, essentially pulled out of nowhere. We basically just put that I think for as our term. Uh, so what what that has led to is uh, many many other kind of battery models. I will talk about one, uh, but there are many other aspects of batteries which this model that I'll present also does not capture. So, at the very least, you can imagine I would like to mod model the state of charge of the battery, which is how long currently I'm using the battery, when would the battery die, so that I can, my operating system can do some interesting stuff. Uh, you can imagine also I would like to model the life of the battery, which is the state of health. When would it be that the battery will need to Place. And these are two different kind of models. They are modeling different things. The one I would like to focus on is the um, state of charge related stuff and show that how a complicated uh, physical battery can be reduced to a relatively simple model and, uh, uh, and, and how they can be used. So, um, ultimately, battery is electrochemical. So, you could certainly imagine. Uh, developing a uh, model of the underlying electrochemical processes and that's what people in electrochemistry do. So uh, there's a very well-known model called dual coil on the BC Berkeley. Uh, very accurate, lots of equations, lots of parameters, gives very good results but it's also very long in terms of simulation time so you cannot really use it in loop to do anything and let alone kind of analyze it. So not easy to use an optimal So when low power became something which computer scientists began to worry quite a bit about um, from a system perspective, we needed more abstract models. And the Pukert model was there, the k times i to the power alpha, but it was very limiting in the sense it doesn't model uh, a lot of these effects and even for rate capacity effect, it's not very accurate. So then people began to go up and, and rate, uh, rate uh, relaxation effect in model. So uh, people began to come up with other kind of models, like for example, some early efforts went after modeling batteries with Markov chains. So kind of the idea is that uh, there are sort of two types of states, the one where the battery is being used and the other where the battery is relaxing. And then you kind of wrap it around some sort of model. But uh, again, uh, sort of not this sort of uh, One model, which I guess at this stage is around a dozen year old or so, uh, which caught on quite a bit is the so called battery of So that's that's the one which sort of gives very good accuracy, is used uh, uh, quite extensively. So the way it works is the following. So they start with a very idealized physical model of the battery and then draw a computational model out of that. And uh, the resulting computational model is one which is both easily simulatable as well as amenable to analysis. So the idea out here is that uh, think of the battery uh, as an electrode and a large amount of chemicals, okay, which is our uh, chemist, the ions basically. And so each one of these little blue bubbles indicate an ion. And when we start out, the battery is full. Uh, we were not using it, so it kind of looks like this. Okay. And let's uh, uh, let and, and, and essentially a real battery will also have the other electrode on the far side that you can sort of uh, it's too far away from the other electrode. 
Now, uh, the, what the, when we say that the battery has died, what really we are saying is something about what is the concentration of these ions at the temperature at x equal to zero. So what's happening is as we use the battery, in effect, the charge is being extracted off of the electrode, and therefore these ions are being consumed. But these ions have mass, so it's not as if the level of these ions just falls uniformly, but it must actually be fallen, which is the Ions are being consumed out here, so to say, or the charge is being consumed. Um, and so, therefore, what is happening is there's a fall off out here, but since these things are plugging, so therefore, uh, so we, there would be a diffusion process kind of going on out here. Okay, so it's a uniform fall off immediately. It will look something like this. As far away, the concentration will still be high, but then there will be a gradual tapering off. And at the electrode, uh, it reaches, uh, it, it, it falls, and when it reaches uh, some uh, value which is low enough or let's say zero, then the battery dies. Now, if let's say something like this has happened, we stop using the battery, that is stop consuming the ions, the ions will still keep moving because there is a gradient out here and therefore after some time it will sort of level off again and then we again start the process all over. So, uh, intuitively if we are able to kind of reduce this thing to a nice computational model, then this will capture uh, all those effects we are talking about, rate capacity because the rate at which we are consuming the ions as well as its relaxation effect because it will model the diffusion dynamics of the ions. And then ultimately the battery discharges when the first time we hit some critical threshold and let's say for sake of argument is zero. That is the first time we see that the charge at the electrode is zero, the concentration of ions at the electrode is zero, then that's when things, uh, things break down. So essentially what we are modeling is a one-dimensional diffusion process where we are modeling the concentration as a function of x and our criterion for declaring the battery to be dead is that concentration at x equal to zero becomes zero the first time. So the first time uh, it happens that that concentration is zero, then the battery is dead, okay? And of course, the rate at which you are consuming the ions depends upon the rate uh, how your load is working, okay? so. If the load is duty cycling, like runs for a while, stops running for a while, all it is saying is that what is the rate at which we are consuming things out here, consuming the charge. What it does not model is a voltage, but you can imagine that voltage would have some relationship with the charge out here, okay, the charge that we are putting out here. Uh, so that could be kind of a separate, uh, separate model. And also it is not modeling aging. So nothing in this thing says anything about like how many, uh, what happens if I recharge it and uh, also there is no recharging model. So this is purely a model of I'm starting with a charged battery and I'm consuming the charge out of it according to a current profile and uh, I want to make a prediction about that the battery died and when is it going to die and then hopefully manage it in a way that I can extend the lifetime. So uh, what ends up happening out here is uh, uh, we are as I said, we worry about the concentration as a function of time. So concentration at location x and at time t. And uh, so that's what we are looking at. Uh, so uh, the life of the battery depends upon what is happening at the surface of the electrode, so x, x equal to 0. <coughs> and let's assume that there's an initial concentration, which we denote, denote as t star. And then finally, let's say rho of t is 1 minus C0 T over C star. So what is happening out here is when I start out, um, rho of C0 T would be T star, so this would be 0. And then as when the battery dies, then C0 T would be 0. Uh, and therefore, uh, rho of T would be 1. Uh, 1 star by the 0 would be 1. Okay, So rho of T is basically saying something about how much of the usable charge I have So when C0t drops to a cutoff value, we basically declare it dead. So let's say the lifetime of the battery was say L. So C0t will reach the cutoff value at T equal to L. Now the behave the 1D diffusion equations are called fixed equation, fixed laws, and they basically uh, consist of two uh, partial differential equations. Uh, one of them as, uh, 
this is basically the plus situation. So basically saying the current across the network surface relates to what is called the plus situation, the changing at the surface. If you remember any of the physics, it's kind of you'll have some vague recollection of that. And the other one is saying something about how the charge is moving. So this is, uh, this is, this is so, so the big B uh, in both cases are diffusion, diffusion constant. So essentially it's saying something about how the charges are moving. Uh, oh. So see these two equations collectively describe our system. And the idea then is could I, uh, could I make my system in a way that sort of instead of dealing with these PDEs, we have some simpler parametric model which is computationally better for us. So J X of T is the flux at time T at distance X. Uh, so at the surface of the electrode, it would correspond to the flux. D is the basic constant. Now, if you recall um, the calculus, to solve PDEs, you also need to know the boundary conditions. Depending upon what the boundary conditions are, the solution differs. So what are the boundary conditions in this case? Well, um, uh, one boundary condition basically is that at the surface of the electrode, the flux is going to be proportional to the current. And the other is that at the far end of the battery, and this is an approximation, we basically said the far end of the battery, uh, the x, and that is at x equal to w, uh, the flux is zero. There's Things are way too far away. So imagine a semi-infinite battery. So at far away, um, the concentration doesn't doesn't change. You basically, uh, keep the this is an approximation. So what that translates into is that essentially we have two boundary conditions. One basically is saying what is happening at x equal to zero, and that that is going to be i of t, and i of t will be decided by our load, or the R control, uh, and then there are area and some and the other is at x equal to w, what is happening? Uh, without going into the mathematical details, uh, it turns out that with these boundary conditions, you end up with a nice closed form solution. So the closed form solution looks like the following. It basically says that rho of t, and if you recall, rho of t was 1 minus the, going back out here, rho of t was defined in terms of the concentration. Uh, at the surface of the electrode. So uh, it turns out that it looks like the following. It says that the charge consumed is equal to some constant term, integral of 0 to t of i of tau t tau. What does this term represent? So if this is the current, the battery I'm integrating over time, so what do you think in answer? energy drawn, energy over, it relates, if I multiply it by the voltage, it would be the energy taken by the load. So this is the useful work done by the load, okay? Then I have this other term, which depends on the constant term, but it also has all these other stuff. And this is the part which basically corresponds to the non-ideality of the battery. If my battery was ideal, then this term will disappear uh, because uh, the D will cause it to disappear. And I will basically be left saying that the charge drawn rho of t is equal to the charge drawn by rho. But because of this non ideality, the rho of t uh, is equal to charge drawn by the load plus this unusable charge because, because of the non ideality of the battery. And this one is a complicated looking term. I mean, it has an integral and all of it is inside. Uh, infinite time, uh, infinite series. So sigma n equal to one to infinity. So m appears out here, and then this term, the term which relates to our energy. So uh, you can play a little bit more uh, constant manipulation. So there are two constants, alpha and beta. So this translates into saying alpha is equal to zero to L i of tau d tau. Okay. So uh, L is remember the lifetime. So this is basically saying, uh, so this term basically says how much charge is consumed by the load before the back, before the battery dies, right? So L is uh, when the concentration at the electrode reaches the cutoff value. So the first term, uh, so if, if I had an ideal battery, then essentially it would look like alpha is equal to 0 to 
well, I have now the DAO and that's it. Sorry. But I have this additional term uh, and now beta corresponds to this. So beta is where our executed uh, term comes in. So it appears out here and I have this you know, incorrect series sort of a thing here. Okay, but it's mathematically, it's, it's a closed form solution. It does have integrals and all, but it's uh, sort of a reasonably nice closed form solution. Also. Okay, so uh, what all of this, so firstly, if you look at this thing, there are exactly two parameters in this model, alpha and beta. The, everything, uh, the, the, everything else is either kind of a variable for our uh, uh, integration or index for our summation, and L is the lifetime of the battery, right? So if I'm trying to characterize the battery, uh, I would need to know alpha and beta, and then I will provide the I of tau. So for example, if I am using the battery by drawing the current out in a, uh, at a constant rate, then I of tau would be a constant. Uh, and I'm interested in finding L, right? I mean, so essentially my goal out of this is if I knew alpha and beta and I knew I of tau, then I would like to be able to compute the L. Okay, so uh, that's what this battery model would seek to provide. So there are two parameters. Question then becomes, how can I estimate it? Uh, so the right hand side represents the capacity of the battery. The first term, as we saw, is the charge consumed by the system. The second term is the amount of charge that could not be used because it was there in the battery, but it is not, uh, but it is not at the right place. It is not at the electrode. So as beta increases, the second term goes to zero. So large beta means that a battery is a pra practically an ideal source. And uh, because essentially that means that diffusion happens too quickly, that essentially the battery uh, concentration that the battery is going on. So uh, to estimate these alpha and beta, kind of the idea then becomes the following: that you do a series of constant load tests. So you take the battery and you subject it to a uh, bunch of experiments where you are going to draw a constant current. And then you will observe when the battery dies. Okay, so you're going to do it some values i1, i2, i3, so on and so forth. And then for each one of those, you are going to get some life cycle. So you are going to have a pair of values i1, l1, i2, l2, so on for n experiments. And then <coughs> the idea is that you are going to estimate alpha and beta so that we minimize the error. So uh, given the alpha and beta, um, uh, and, and, and we are applying these uh, constant, constant terms. So the kind of idea is that we know the current is constant. So we can use our equation and given the lifetime and alpha and beta, I can get an estimated current. And I, the current that I applied across the n experiments, I want to be able to do all these things. So this is essentially a regression process that is happening. And we end up computing alpha and beta out of, out of this. So the entire battery, Kind of got reduced to uh, these, these two, these two numbers, okay. and it turns out the results are actually pretty good with this. So some uh, the original paper, the experiments they presented, they were with the early generation of mobile class devices and all, and within a few percentage points. Now, of course, there is still dependence upon temperature and things like that, and the other thing is that we haven't dealt with this issue of what happens. Like, now let's say I give you the alpha and beta. Okay, the problem here also is I'm not telling you anything about you know, how to handle this inference part. So it turns out that what uh, these terms are decreasing, and it turns out that the first 10, 15 terms are usually sufficient. So usually, what they do, basically, what they do is they just look at the first few terms and incorporate that into the model. So that's where it goes, and that gives you a pretty, pretty good result. Uh, I, uh, in any given application, I of tau is going to be something which, the two possible scenarios, you are given the I of tau, okay, and, um, so like for example, it's constant, so it's duty cycling, like it's zero and goes to some level for some time, goes to zero, and then you are asked for what would be the lifetime, and you can, one can calculate that. Uh, in some, you can even use this model in a real time sense, that is you keep track of where do I stand now, and that given the 
given the same current profile for the future, how long will the battery last? So you can actually use this model in a real time simulation tool for a, or as part of a battery management system as well. So this is an example of some, uh, so, so it does much better than Fuker's thing. Uh, more very critically, it handles the relaxation effect also. So there are many battery models around, but uh, I guess uh, when it comes to battery lifetime, as in for a given level of charge, what is happening, this particular model is probably the one which is most commonly used, at least in computer science community. But there are a whole bunch of other terms there, um, empirical models, based upon physical models, and stuff like that. Uh, alternative to batteries. Okay, so, oh, so. I, what I have not talked about is the models with modeling the voltage, and uh, but you can imagine that just like I said, voltage tells you the state of charge. You can go the reverse. State of charge tells you something about the voltage. This would be something like current. Uh, first, has to the current term thrown in. The other thing I I didn't cover at all is uh, how to model the aging of the battery. That is, what as we use the battery, what will happen. Alternatives to battery. The problem with batteries obviously are many, which we can all know about. So there are alternatives which are also sort of explored. So fuel cells is one. Uh, they've been around for a long while. Uh, they never took off on mobile devices because of safety issues, but they are used in uh, homes or buildings as well as in cars. In fact, some of you might have heard about that last year, Toyota and Tesla had a bit of a public tip over what technology is going to work, and Toyota decided to go for so called hydrogen cars. Hydrogen cars are nothing but as you see, basically fuel cell based cars. Uh, so, es essentially, uh, some car companies are going after fuel cells, some are going to take the place of batteries like that. So, the way, uh, so Nice. So, thing about fuel cell is, it can store large amounts of energy, much more, much more than kind of uh, standard sort of batteries that we normally think. And they come in many different varieties, but they all work on the basic principle as the following: that there is some source of hydrogen, some chemical, methane, hydrogen trapped in some carbon nanotube, things like that. Some sort of a source of hydrogen. And then what we do is uh, uh, we have it react with some source of oxygen, which is put in the air. And then the reaction that takes place results in water, as well as uh, so water is kind of a waste product. And then kind of uh, it generates uh, this current from here. Right? So there's a very high level that's kind of the concept. So what you really need for this this thing to work out is uh, some sort of how, how concentrated that source of hydrogen is, the one which kind of creates how the cell does. So there are some examples out here, like liquid hydrogen, uh, methanol, hydrogen and graphite, all these different things, and they have different uh, uh, units to store energy. By contrast, this is our battery, and what you can see here is that most of these things are significantly more dense than things like this. So kind of the concept in, is that when the battery runs out, when the fuel cell runs out, you replace the fuel. So uh, for mobile devices, kind of the concept was that there could be some sort of a socket in which you will put uh, methanol, sort of little tubes full of methanol. Okay, so you kind of swap. That's your battery. You kind of swap it. Uh, but there are many different chemistries. Some of these things are kind of obviously liquid hydrogen and all that is far out. Uh, kind of stuff. Uh, hydrogen trapped in that right now. So fuel cells are used in like buildings and all. Um, one of the applications recently people have explored is fuel cells in data centers. So kind of the concept now is the following. So uh, if you recall some of my slides from lecture, first couple of lectures, the data center has all this complicated power supply infrastructure. And there are a lot of wastage of energy in, in that as we went through a series of energy transformation tools. 
So concept that uh, some people are advocating, uh, in particular from Microsoft, for example, is that instead of distributing electricity, you distribute natural gas to the vat in a data center. And then generate, uh, using fuel cells, you generate the necessary electricity out of that. That's, that's kind of the concept. Uh, so this is the architecture, they call it as distributed fuel cell architecture, but basically we are distributing natural gas and eliminating the power infrastructure. So essentially, traditional data structure is like servers, it's kind of a whole series of like gradual reduction of voltages and all, and you have UPS, so you have battery backups. In this data center, literally like the way we, using pipes, we distribute natural gas to home, that's what you're doing, you're distributing natural gas to the servers, but right at the servers, you have fuel cells, okay, and they're operating off this source of hydrogen data. So this is a DSP architecture, and what uh, some of the sort of small scale experiments and analysis and all this have shown that um, uh, they work pretty well with <coughs> significant advantages. Um, uh, there are certain uh, things like could these things very rapidly respond to change in computational loads. So that's on the answer is yes. Um, what is the efficiency? So end-to-end -end efficiency is 52%. Now it sounds bad, but it actually is pretty good when compared against the traditional electricity usage because it has its own lossage all across every transformer and everything. Bottom line turns out that at least it appears that uh, this kind of approach is more cost efficient. So essentially what they, these guys end up showing out here is that this is a traditional data center and to drive a 100 kilowatt server, what they're showing is how much energy is needed. Um, in this case, uh, 570 watt kilowatt and it is uh, in this case uh, uh, some feet of field. What they're doing is they're looking at the overall loss, like all the way back to the generator at the, at the, at the power grid. So it's bottom line basically is that the sort of claim out here is that fuel cells can actually be more resilient and more sustainable in the system. But what we're replacing is distributing electricity versus this and that. Joseph. Actually, turns out not because the chemical like its output is is, uh, is water. The waste product is water. Okay, so it's actually fuel cells are considered to be clean technology, unlike batteries, which use all these complicated electrolytes and all. Here, the discharge is actually with water, which is not so okay. But they still have safety issues because hydrogen is explosive, okay, natural gas, right? So there is a safety issue, and which is why the mobile phone. I mean, I I recall back in late 90s and all, there were all these cover stories and like. Scientific American and all, like fuel cells are going to take care of our battery problem. And this what 15 years since and nothing happened. And part of the problem is having methane and all getting in uh, the mobile devices that we carry inside the plane and all is just never going to be approved. So it never happened. Uh, in home data centers and all, I mean, at home we already do have the natural gas supply. So um, uh, that's that's an now, still it's a uh, boutique technology, okay? And uh, the Tesla, Toyota sort of war of words that I was referring to, I mean, uh, Tesla basically said Toyota is insane uh, kind of thing and all, but Toyota believes in the hydrogen cars and all, so that's what they're kind of saying. And time will tell this thing is solved. Uh, eventually, in case of electric vehicles, both of them fundamentally are generating electricity. Okay, the question is how are you generating the electricity? The rest of the car is going to be the same. Uh, that is, we don't have an internal combustion engine, we have an electric motor. Uh, the question basically is really uh, how are you delivering, uh, uh, in case of Tesla, you charge the battery through electricity. In case of Toyota, it's going to be you refuel it with hydrogen. And that's really going to be the difference. So fundamentally boils down to how do I package energy and put it into whatever system I'm after? 
these guys are playing on the same thing, which is basically saying that, look, let's package energy as natural gas to deliver all the way to the computer and then use a fuel cell as a local generator. So it sounds like from this perspective, Tesla has an edge because they can just charge your car in your house just like you can if you have hydrogen in your house, right? True. Uh, flip side is that Tesla has a disadvantage when it comes to creating the infrastructure for charging while you're not at home. Right. Are there more hydrogen fuel stations? Uh, well, uh, actually, our fuels are already hydrogen rich, right? I mean, it's, uh, so the theory is that they can be easily retrofitted to deliver hydrogen. And they already are. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have seen methane driven or natural gas driven buses and stuff like that. Okay, so very quickly. So, so that's kind of theory. Okay, uh, uh, certainly this is more, much more than simply kind of this technical issue. There is kind of a lot of economics infrastructure kind of issues surrounding it, okay? And people are doing all these kind of technologies and all sort of trying to test. America is rich in natural gas, so there is an attack that can store that naturally. Um, uh, on the flip side, I mean, Tesla um, has, I'm sure you have seen these things where Tesla basically has a robotic arm which comes and swaps the battery, so that's not their take. There is other forms of environmental footprint consideration, lithium-ion batteries have a lot of toxic footprint, so yeah. Uh, complicated, complicated mix of issues out there. So, uh, to summarize, when it comes to the storing energy for, for whatever, essentially taking chemical energy of this form and converting it into electricity or electricity back into chemical energy, um, uh, the batteries are that device. One other thing I would mention is there's some pretty cool work. Um, I forget his name, chemical engineering professor out here. Famous actually, his labs are on that side of the building on this floor. Uh, so he works on converting electricity into biofuel. So that because the idea is that biofuels are very like uh, they're, they're very they can store lots of energy, so they're easier to transport and all. Okay, so you could also go the other way. So the reverse of reverse direction of the fuel cell. So uh, a lot of his work is addressing that. So anyway, upshot is that you have. Uh, sort of batteries are basically the primary thing at this stage. Uh, capacitors are knocking on the door. In fact, one good, again, survey-oriented area might be to actually look at what are the advances happening both in batteries and particularly on the capacitor side, particularly with um, a lot of work here at UCLA and several other places on, on graphene-based capacitors and stuff like that. That would be a good, good, good topic. Um, I guess for our perspective, uh, from a computing perspective, there are <coughs> a few aspects of batteries that kind of matter. Number one, batteries need to be managed, as we saw, okay? You cannot just take batteries in a very simplistic way because those non-idealities affect the lifetime and all, okay? So, and that you can actively manage through the OS, through the protocol and things like that, and they are done, so okay, I mean, battery management, is. Second thing is you manage the battery for the sake of the battery itself, namely its safety, its health, all those kind of other aspects. And that is not something the OS does, but it's something which embedded software right next to the battery does. And it creates its own sets of issues and all. Just to give you an example, a couple of years ago, uh, some, some, uh, some hacker type in the US kind of pointed out that the processors in the battery are unprotected, uh, their firmware, uh, so in particular he showed it with the Apple laptop. So the firmware for the processor and the battery management system of the batteries in these laptops are basically, they were either passwordless or they were all using the same password which he figured out. And then he was able to change the firmware and then as we discussed, there are then uh, safety consequences of that because once your BMS is compromised, you can cause things to explode no, or what he demonstrated was that it could give a false state of battery. So like you would think your laptop is uh, charged up and it is not, then you unplug the laptop and go away and then it will run out of the So So it could range from nuisance attacks to kind of realistic attacks. Okay. Um, in any case, so battery management system is one place where things come in and there is a lot of control theory type work and all happen there. Uh, I guess here at UCLA, follow some others group and 
Leha's group, these are the two groups who kind of do a lot of work when it comes to managing that region on the energy security side. So, uh, and, and the third aspect is coming up with models of the batteries just to help with these first two tasks. Uh, good models of the battery and uh, that's always a certain, even now, like if you look at conferences and all, uh, the focus has shifted somewhat towards models which are going after these more esoteric effects of batteries, but kind of problem still remains. You want models which are detailed, you want models which are computationally efficient, you want models which can be used in real time because they're part of the BMS or the OS. Uh, so anyway, that's that's all I have to say on the battery and let's take it up next time.